All right. All right. So I want to speak a little bit about like, uh, well, more of a simple uh, experiment that I'm working around the real time, trying to like see um, how fast I can get information to flow through it and like what kind of patterns that I can develop to get uh, a proper like real time system set up. So for that, I basically wrote like a really, really simple hardware monitor. And in this case, it's just really basically monitoring my own laptop. Um, I'm going to like speak a little bit because since I work for Tengen, like my emotional state every time I read Hacker News these days is something like in between like glorious night or, you know, completely disemboweled like uh, developer. But, uh, you know, that's just part of being Tengen, it seems to. So uh, to talk about real time, uh, to understand real time, uh, because we're all kind of like using that term and throwing it around, around a lot lately. Uh, and I think it's kind of important to base it on something that's like a real proper definition. And the core of like being real time is like a, being able to act on the events uh, of the data that you're actually monitoring, right? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think that is true in some cases, and in some cases we're not even close to being real time. And, and then also going to talk a little bit about uh, how's it, how is it looking going forward, and like what kind of potential do we have to actually get proper real time systems in the browser? So the traditional definition looks something more like that. Like uh, you have something like a real time operating system that can schedule stuff exactly at, at known latencies, known processing times. It takes X milliseconds to like execute this function, etc. The environment is usually controlled, like it's a robot drilling or a robot like welding cars, or is a really high-end trade system with like super optimized like non-TCP connection that works where you know exactly how long a packet takes from one place to the other. So if you ever, uh, if you know anything about it, like for example high-speed training, you're gonna know that like the the trading firms actually are putting their um, racks next to the racks from the actual exchange these days to get the minimum amount of latency for the trades, right? So that's like as close as you can get to latency and this is the traditional idea of what we talk about when we're doing real-time systems. So our definition of real-time is something like this. A non-real-time OS, Linux, BSD, OS X, or Windows, it could be that your process is going to take 100 milliseconds. It could be 500 milliseconds. Depends on what's going on in the operating system at that point. Completely random network topologies with unknown latencies. Uh, completely unknown end-to-end -end processing times with huge variations between one message and the next. Completely random hardware performance. And I'm making a shout out here to Amazon because they definitely have this issue. If you have an instance, it could perform really well for a period and really slow for another period. And on a browser, we really are only looking at web sockets as a proper protocol uh, right now. And we're going to touch upon why that is somewhat limiting. And that really makes me feel like a side cat, to be honest. But I hope that like, we can get to a point where we kind of um, really can talk about that in a more positive manner. So I'm kind of like just modified the uh, definition a little bit so it fits more to what we actually do. And I think it's better to just say that, look, uh, we're, we're going to do like uh, handle like processes inside of what an acceptable window of latency, right? So if you're controlling like a flying robot, you might need a very, very low acceptable window of latency because if it's uh, 500 milliseconds, that thing smashed into the, into the, uh, you know, into the floor or into the wall. But if you're just you know, pushing some analytics, maybe it's okay to have 700 milliseconds uh, latency between the message being recorded and the message actually uh, being displayed. And it actually affects the way you think about modeling your application because the first question you do is like, what is the acceptable time from collection to display in my application? And so for some uh, particular uh, domains like games, that needs to be really short, right? Because if you're uh, pushing a position for a gamer about, like, let's say, every 100 milliseconds, right? That means you're going to get about uh, a thousand, uh, well, basically like 10 uh, frames a second of resolution on the movements of the other person. So the milliseconds really affect your ability to play that game in an effect, and you get killed, right? So. What I did is like I'm starting to put together a very, very simple uh, real-time application 
uh, it basically collects a uh, bunch of met metrics from uh, Linux or OS X, uh, publishes them to a central server, uh, then buffers and streams them to the client. Uh, I wrote, uh, started the port of uh, PSUtil from Python to Node. So it's on uh, GitHub. You can use it if you want to pull stuff like processes or uh, CPU times or memory usage or disk usage or whatever from your computer. Uh, if you feel that you can help, just uh, send me a pull request. I'm going to work on it slowly, eventually adding Windows support as well. Uh, all the operations are asynchronous uh, using libuv. Uh, only supports Linux and OS X Darwin right now. Uh, not everything is implemented. Uh, real time basically is a very simple application. Uh, it's also on GitHub. You can also pull that out. Uh, you'll have to bear with the look and feel uh, because as Nuno said, like I'm also a back-end developer, which means uh, design sucks. Um, it contains basically a metrics collection agent, uh, just a collection server, uh, some metrics buffering uh, using MongoDB. I'll touch why I'm using MongoDB for this, but, uh, but I'll also touch what you don't have to use MongoDB for this. Uh, web sockets and a dashboard. Uh, one of the first things I had to do was basically define a protocol because the moment you're talking over WebSocket, you basically are defining a protocol, uh, how your clients are talking to your backend. And in this case, it was very simple. You could subscribe or unsubscribe to servers events. Uh, you could list the number of servers available for, for actually getting metrics from. And you can pause and stop, uh, well, pause and stop basically the, the, the stream. I think that was supposed to be start. But, uh, I might have a copy and paste error here. All right, so let's start. Uh, come on. So as we can see right up here, it's just showing it's like gray, which means there's no activity. It lets me just start up an agent. Uh, it pops up. It's alive. We click on it, and it'll like show basically like some behavior on my computer. And you can see a couple of the process lists and stuff like that. Whoop. So that's on GitHub. You can use that. So the flow is fairly simple. Uh, you collect a metric. Uh, you send it to server. You write it to a cap collection. I'll touch on that, what that is. Uh, you write it to a historic store uh, for functionality I have yet to implement, which is like being able to look over time how your CPU usage varied. And then I'm streaming data from the cap collections to the clients. And the reason I'm using cap collection is that uh, I want it to be possible for any client to connect to any process that's running on uh, Node.js, right? So when you boot a typical box, you're going to put more than one process all sharing the same socket. So it means at any given point in time, your WebSocket client could be connecting to one process or the other. So if you wanted to actually share state, you'd have to do fairly complicated inter-process uh, communication. To avoid that, we're using MongoDB as a giant ring buffer. And the cap collection is basically a collection with a fixed size. Documents can't change. And when you reach the end of the collection, it starts over on the other side. So it basically overwrites the first documents. So it works as a giant buffer. Uh, you can do some nice things on it, like you can, for example, have a query uh, that uh, listens to any new documents coming, uh, but looking on a specific field in the document, for example. So you can have different types of documents. It's fixed memory size. Uh, it's first in, first out. And because it's shared between all of the processes, uh, they can all listen to it. And all WebSocket clients connecting will be able to get exactly the same messages. And it can also be replicated, which means that you can uh, potentially uh, read from the uh, secondaries or the slaves. So the experiment was very uh, like useful. And uh, I'm, like, I'm hoping to keep uh, extending it a little bit. I want to do the agent a little bit more generalized, and so maybe just blog it up so that uh, people can have an uh, example to look on uh, when they actually want to start collecting their own metrics or send stuff through uh, into an actual collection server. Uh, the agent uh, is, has like a partially upgradable transport, which means that it will actually uh, try, you can say, try to talk UDP. And if UDP is not available, try TCP or WebSockets and finally fall back to HTTP. Um, obviously, you need to finish up the app over time. Just didn't have enough time. 
uh, and I need to add more metrics and aggregated metrics. And uh, I want to experiment with a couple of different real-time models, and I'm going to talk about that briefly. So this is the world of networking, right? It's like this is the most chaotic picture you can probably come, uh, think about when it comes to like networking. And it actually leads us to the next question, which is like, do we need an ACK, right? So one of the things with WebSockets and TCP is that TCP is an in-order protocol. So that means that like, it's going to wait for the next message to come before it gives you. Uh, so if message A comes in, it's going to wait for message B to come in before it re uh, accepts message C. So if uh, message B disappears somewhere in this network and is late to the party, it's just going to hold the flow until uh, message uh, B actually arrives. So this causes packet delays. Uh, packet delays can cause stalls in the pipe. And this has like a really, really bad effect on like real-time applications, especially if you're operating in high latency networks like 3G or something like that. These stalls will happen much more often than you're used to. And so you'll get uh, things that are going to come in like waves of performance, like depending on the quality of the network. And this really blows for like real-time gaming. Because for gaming, you really need that high dependency you know, on, on a particular latency to be able to play the game. So UDP sounds like the perfect solution. It's like no order guarantee. You can lose packets. Who cares? It's nowhere in the browser. And you might be able to uh, bridge it with Flash if you really, really tried. So what kind of options do we have if you want to do some UDP? Well, there's a Flash UDP bridge. You could write one, probably. Um, there's a native client API on Chrome. There's no support for UDP in the browser. Or there is this new promising thing called data channel in WebRTC. Well, it's not really completely UDP, but it's close. It's called SCTP, which means the Stream Control Transmission Protocol. And you're all going to remember that in about a year when they finally like, uh, decide on this. So what's WebRTC? So everybody's seen like, the demos of WebRTC. You can do your own fine, uh, you know, fancy camera and do like, uh, talk, you know, can video uh, chat between two browsers, this kind of stuff, right? Anybody who hasn't seen it? All right, so everybody's seen it. So that's like a really, really nice part of it, but I don't really care about that part. The thing that I really care about is data channels. And data channels, unfortunately, has not yet been ratified as a 1.0 spec. But data channels basically is this real-time web uh, promise. So it supports both in-order and out-of-order messages. And it also supports peer-to-peer -peer connections. But I'm not going to really get into that. But you can already start thinking about the implications of that. So, What's the great thing about STP? Well, it's connection-oriented, just like TCP. It's full duplex. It has a reliable data transfer, which means messages will arrive complete. Uh, you can have partial reliable data transfers, but I don't think they're going to implement that at WebR, uh, WebRTC. Uh, you can have ordered delivery, and most importantly, you can have unordered data delivery. So in a game, for example, it probably doesn't matter if you lose frame uh, you know, message B out of A, B, and C. Because C is like the latest uh, position anyway. So it's whatever is the latest uh, position that matters. But now C doesn't need to wait for B anymore. So the really, really simple thing for us is like to be an optimist in this case, because I think it's going to happen. I think we're going to move in the direction of getting a proper real-time web out there and to avoid like, falling into the doldrums of negativity. And that's pretty much it.